And the reality is that all three economic blocs perceive the global South, Africa in particular, more or less in the same way, with slight variation, in the sense that they perceive us as the place that will continue to provide cheap raw materials, the place that will continue to consume the industrial output of the global north. They continue to perceive us as the place where they can outsource uh, obsolete technologies, assembly line manufacturing. Um, and number four, they perceive us as the place for exotic tourism destinations. And, and that perception, and, and we can debate the perception, is the same role that we played during colonial times, the same role that we played in post-colonial times, and that cannot be the same role that we will continue to play for the next hundred years. So it's important for Africa in particular, for the global south in general, to have a strategic vision for itself in this political geopolitical space and to assert and reposition itself uh, otherwise, if, if you don't have a strategic vision for yourself, you're definitely going to be part of somebody else's strategic vision. And, and that is that has to be part of the conversation as we rethink the role of DFIs, as, as we rethink multilateral development institutions, we have to put that geopolitical question, economic question uh, in uh, on the table. And, and that's what I uh, try to uh, convey in, uh, in, in this work. Um, I, I wanted to draw your attention to this report, the Just Transition Report, um, and I'm putting it in the chat here for people who are on, on the chat. Um, many of you have probably seen it. It's available in both in English and French. So some of the uh, message that I'm conveying here is, is, is from this uh, report that we uh, published um, a few months ago uh, in May, essentially. Um, so... And, and one of the main messages that we convey in this in this report is that we we can't isolate climate, energy, and development policies. They have to be addressed simultaneously. And in today's presentation, I'll illustrate why that is the case. Um, on on the climate front, if we're serious about some existential uh, questions, and I, I know UNCTAD is is taking this seriously, and other uh, international institutions are taking it seriously. Uh, but we need the development finance institutions to take it more seriously, not just as window dressing, not just as as a as a you know an, a necessity to address it on the side, but as a fundamental question. And this picture here is very simple. It's from a UNEP report, the United Nations Environmental Program. It's called the Production Gap Report, published a few years ago, and it's a very simple gap. It's a gap between how much we're planning to extract and burn by 2030, 2040, et cetera relative to how much we're actually allowed to extract and burn if we're going to meet the challenge, the climate challenge at 2% or 1.5% warming by the end of the century. And as you can see, the gap is essentially, uh, we're on track to produce and burn twice as much as we're allowed to, to, to stay on track to, to meet the climate challenge, which means the science is very clear. We can, you know, reform the entire system. We can all become vegans tomorrow. We can, you know, change our lifestyles, you know, you know, dramatically. But if we don't phase out fossil fuels, we're not going to meet the challenge. And that means starting immediately by not adding additional fossil fuel infrastructure. In other words, capital expenditure on fossil fuels cannot continue at the same pace as we speak the major fossil fuel companies are adding between 500 billion and $1 trillion annually of new fossil fuel infrastructure. That's guaranteed to be stranded assets. So that's the first thing to do is to stop adding infrastructure and adding new infrastructure on the renewable side. And number two, having a, a rapid phase out plan, which is why many organizations around the world have been uh, endorsing the call for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, uh, and you can check out the website and and, um, and and learn more about why the treaty is important and what is included in the treaty is a just transition and economic development vision for countries in the global south that rely heavily on fossil fuels uh, for fueling their economy or also as a source of revenue. So those have to be taken into account. Um, in terms of the scale of the challenge, and, and this is from the World Bank, this is a World Bank report called Groundswell, it came out uh, a couple of years ago. The, the numbers uh, are 
and the numbers are relatively conservative but but scary in the sense that is the world prepared for mass movement of people that is driven by climate change and we talk about mass movement of people displaced in Africa and Latin America and other places um, it's going to add clearly additional pressure on the receiving countries or region in terms of housing uh, pressure in terms of health, uh, food, uh, jobs, and in many cases, historical cases, we know that movement of people that creates this kind of pressure also exacerbates conflicts and creates new conflicts. So this is uh, this is a serious threat in terms of the, the climate impact, the economic impact, the security impact. And all we hear is we need to scale up um, financing for climate action. And, and I'm all for scaling up financing for climate action, but that in and of itself, as I'll uh, demonstrate today, is actually not sufficient to meet the challenge. Uh, and we'll see why. So one simple um, picture here. Uh, this is the green line. If you just focus on the green line, I'll translate it for you in, in a couple of sentences. If you divide the world in, into global north and global south, and you net out all global financial transactions, uh, trade, uh, FDI, remittances, uh, illicit financial transactions are included here. What you find is that green line has been accelerating for the last couple of decades. And the latest data point we have is $2 trillion moving in the wrong direction, moving from the global south to the global north, which means we have a global trade and financial architecture that's been designed and that has been producing this effect. In other words, when we talk about reforming the global financial architecture today and the international trade system, we have a very simple message and statement to deliver at the international level, which is a, a global financial architecture that was designed in 1944, not designed by us, the global South, not designed for us, cannot be the system today that will save us. This is the system that failed us economically, financially, and ecologically. It can't be the same financial architecture that will save us today and that will address the multiple crises that we're dealing with. So that has to be a fundamental point of discussion in any climate debate, in any development debate, in any reform debate. So the question becomes, are we transforming the system in this process of reforming the global financial system? Or are we window dressing the system without addressing the underlying structures that create this effect? That what I call the neocolonial uh, um, wealth extraction, net wealth extraction. And this is, this is the summary of where we are today. You have $2 trillion moving in the wrong direction. And compared to the climate finance landscape that we've been debating for years, uh, a promise of $100 billion a year that hasn't been delivered, not even close. Uh, a green climate fund with all the good intentions that last time I checked had about $12 billion in it, 11 or $12 billion with very serious conditionalities for the entire global south, for an entire group of vulnerable countries on, on the climate front. And that white dot that you can't see, that's the $0 billion in the loss and damage fund that was created last year and remains empty and hopefully COP28 will, will change that. But that's the, that's, the, that's the summary of where we are. So when we talk about scaling up finance for climate action, are we talking about 100 billion, 300, 500, while at the same time, the global South is losing $2 trillion a year in net global financial transactions. So we have to put things in perspective. And when we address these reforms, they have to be transformative in reversing these flows and, and rebalancing the global economy, rebalancing trade and, and financial flows. So what creates this imbalance are key structural economic deficiencies that must be addressed from a, a radical perspective. And radical, I don't mean it in the political sense, I mean it in the literal sense of the term. What does it mean to be radical? It means going to the roots of the problem. And if you're not addressing the root of the problem, you're addressing the problem at the surface, which means you're superficial. Your intervention is superficial. And superficial intervention 
reproduces the status quo. So we have to be very honest about what we're doing. Are we intervening with transformative reforms or superficial reforms? And, and to me, that's the lens with which I, I, uh, I assess uh, what, we're, what we're doing in, in the global financial system. So the, the high level of external debt, and we're in the process of kind of slow motion going to a, a global south debt crisis. To me, the external debt is, is a very serious problem, but it's also a symptom of structural weaknesses that must be addressed. External debt emerges because of these structural uh, weaknesses and, and deficiencies. And the root causes in the global south in general, in Africa in particular, are three major problems. Number one, energy deficits. Number two, food deficits. And number three, low value added industrialization or purely extractive industries. Um, so what do I mean by that? When, when I talk about food deficits, we're talking about a continent, Africa, that imports 85% of its food today, the most fertile land on the planet. And it's not because of climate change and droughts. Yes, climate change and droughts made things more difficult. But this is a systematic process that started in the mid-1950s, early 1960s, when most African economies and most African countries gained independence. Uh, 1955, European nations met in Rome, and that started the process of the European Union. And one of the major items discussed at the time was, what are we going to do about our food sovereignty? We depend on the global south and former colonies for our food security. So that began the process of um, uh, negotiations that led to 1962, the common agricultural policy, which is in place to this day, a core feature of the European Union. And it's not just the European Union, the US, Canada, Japan, Australia, and the former Soviet Union, which is why Russia and the Ukraine are very important in the food space. All of those major blocks started investing heavily and in supporting core crop production uh, in their own economy. So wheat, barley, soybean, corn, and so on. And that by the early 1960s put Africa in particular and a lot of the global South in the position where our farmers couldn't compete in the wheat market and the barley market and the corn and soybean market. So what do you do as a farmer when you can't sell your crops at the international level? You have to either give up farming and move to the cities and earn as you know, and work as unskilled labor now in the tourism industry or in the assembly line manufacturing industry or extractive industries, or switch crops. You stop producing the core crops that feed the nation and you start producing cash crops for exports. And, and that starts the process of destroying your agriculture, not just from an economic standpoint, but also from a from a biodiversity and ecologic stand standpoint. Why? Because now you're serving foreign customers, so you have to serve their taste, which means very often you have to import foreign seeds that can't survive in your climate unless you pump them with fertilizers and pesticides and water that you frequently don't have. And when you do that, after 10 years, you've destroyed the productivity of the quality of your soil and your yields start to decline. So you have to double down and do even more of the fertilizers and pesticides uh, and, and foreign seeds that are that can you know survive in your climate. Um, and, and, and you have to cultivate more acreage because your yield is declining. Uh, and that's part of the challenge that we're facing today. It's very hard to reverse that process because in many cases to give your land time to rest and recover, it takes seven to 10 years. And that transition is not possible for individual farmers to do and even for individual countries in the global to do without transfer of technology, without financial resources, without strategic uh, cooperation, both in the global south and in the global north. So that's just an example of how we got into that food deficit trap. On the energy front, take a country like Nigeria, one of the biggest producers of oil, today imports 100% of its gasoline. Mexico today imports 50% of its gasoline from the United States. So it, it brings us to that third point, which is the, this, this trap that we're in, whereby you import high value added content, you export low value added content, no matter how much you export, no matter how much you 
accelerate your exports. You're constantly in a structural trade deficit position. And as you know, if you have a structural trade deficit, your currency is constantly under pressure and gets weaker and weaker relative to the dollar, to the euro. So what do you do when you have a weak currency? Everything you import the next morning, whether it's food or fuel or medicine, is going to cost you more. This is the inflation pass-through effect. So you have food and fuel price inflation. That's very destabilizing, very dangerous. So what do our governments do? They intervene with a Band-Aid solution with food subsidies and fuel subsidies for social peace, for stability. And our central banks intervene artificially in the foreign exchange market to stabilize the exchange rate. And how do you intervene as a central bank? You have to have dollars to intervene in the foreign exchange market to stabilize your currency. You're essentially going into the foreign exchange market as a central bank and buying your own currency artificially with dollars or euros that you must borrow. And that starts to fuel the external debt problem. So that's why I go back to my first point that the external debt is really a symptom of a very serious structural problem. And that structural problem has to do with the way we design the global food system, the global financial system, the international trade system. When you go back to the GATT negotiations, in the early days before the WTO, the, the famous line we hear from the global north explicitly is we believe in free trade in everything but arms and farms. In other words, weapons and food. And, and that is a serious problem that we never resolve to this day. And that keeps us in, in, this, in this structural trap. So to me, the solutions are right there on the slide. If the root causes of this external debt problem, the external debt problem that actually suppresses our fiscal policy space at the national level to address national priorities, the solutions are in investing in energy sovereignty, especially renewable energy sovereignty, investing in food sovereignty and agroecology to you know, re repair the damage and investing in a different kind of industrialization that allows you to produce and retain high value added content and, and, and hence the, the importance of industrialization as part of the solution for the climate challenge, especially in the, in the African context. And I'll lay out some examples. So to, to look at this in, in, in very simple terms, you can just eyeball the problem here. This is Africa's exports as a whole. Notice the, the volume, it's 585. And I picked 2019 uh, just because it's, you know, we, we don't want to worry about the COVID effect, uh, but the, the, you can look at all the years and it's pretty much the same picture. Essentially raw materials, lots of raw materials and, and cash crops. Look at Africa's imports as a whole, $737 billion, and look at the composition and the economic complexity of, of the products that we import, there is a very clear, serious mismatch. And I can do this for dozens of countries in the global south. Here is Kenya. This is Kenya's uh, exports. You can eyeball the problem. Here's Kenya's imports and look at the volume of imports and, 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 uh, and uh, exports. Uh, and, and Kenya is relatively in a good position when it comes to energy because 90% at least of its uh, electricity is renewable here. Um, look at Ghana, right? $25 billion worth of exports, essentially raw materials. And look at Ghana's imports, $27 billion. And the composition is much more uh, sophisticated. Uh, and the food dependency is very clear also in, in Ghana's case. So that produces this pressure on the exchange rate. And the flip side of it is the external debt that almost exactly mirrors that pressure. And, and that's why Ghana today is in, a, is in a debt crisis. I could pick dozens of countries in the global south. The visuals will look essentially the same. So what are the mainstream policies that perpetuate Africa's structural traps? And, and this is where we need to zoom in when we talk about reforms. Are we reforming in the sense of giving Africa a more voice in, in international financial institutions, uh, more presence? Are we changing the model of development, the policies? So here's what we've been doing. Lots of austerity, debt restructuring, which doesn't change any of the foundation of the system. It just stretches the payments, lowers the interest, maybe cancels a little bit of the, the, the payments, but doesn't change very much. Privatizing state-owned enterprises. You know, Give us your airport, give us your airline, uh, privatize this, that, and the other. Yeah, it brings a little bit of cash, 
It's a little bit of oxygen. You spend it in two or three years and then you're back to square one. A labor market flexibility, that's code word for lower wages and, and, and working conditions, race to the bottom. And, and we've all been, been doing this. That doesn't address the structural issues that we're dealing with. Export-led growth and, and foreign direct investment, especially if it's focused on low value added manufacturing, whereby you import the capital, the technology, the intermediate components, the fuel to produce electricity, and you use low cost labor to assemble products with low value added for exports. That never gets you anywhere. That's what produces the negative terms of trade that we're talking about. FDI is actually more dangerous in this sense than export-led growth with domestic firms, because at least domestic firms, their profits are reinvested mostly in the country. Sometimes it's real estate speculation and other, um, but, but FDI re profits are repatriated. So you get nothing out of the process. Um, and, and that's part of the problem. Financial liberalization, uh, we're told, you know, open up your financial market, set up a mini Wall Street, you'll attract a lot of, you know, foreign investment and so on. Uh, we've seen what happened in Mexico and Brazil and Turkey and, and South Africa um, with, with this uh, hot money uh, type of situation. You have a rush of investment because why would anybody leave London or Tokyo or New York and go to uh, an emerging uh, market? you know, uh, financial, uh, you know, stock market, because they don't want the regulation, they want the lower taxes, they want um, a central bank that sets high interest rates artificially and creates high artificial return. So you're guaranteeing you're attracting exclusively speculators who want to buy low and sell high, sell high. And when they do that, of course, you you have a market crash, and then you have a currency crash. And we've seen what happened in Mexico and Brazil and other places where it took up to 10 years to recover from, from that. Tourism is, is also a very dangerous trap. We're told, you know, on the surface, it looks a perfect uh, kind of engine for economic development because you have millions of tourists coming in with dollars and euros. So you bring in foreign currency reserves. You create jobs in the hotels and restaurants and, and transportation industry to support the tourism industry. And what's not to like, except the 10 million tourists that you bring in, you have to feed them. So you have to import more food that you don't have. You have to transport them, heat and cool the hotels for them, including heating the pools sometimes, which means you have to import even more energy that you don't have. And of course, you have to import higher quality food and higher quality equipment for the hotels and the nightclubs and everything else. So tourism for many countries in the global south is actually a net negative if we take into account the, the real effect that we're discussing here. And then finally, you have the challenge of the, the ecological degradation that tourism often, often brings uh, with it. So if you have food sovereignty, if you have energy sovereignty, then yes, tourism can be a net positive and even better if you invest in uh, ecotourism, for example. Remittances, of course, I don't have to explain the, the brain drain that goes with it, but unfortunately, remittances cannot be an engine of development um, or an engine of financing development in the global south. So we end up with a race to the bottom. We end up with more external debt. And we're told there is no alternative. And that's really the, the trap of the mainstream economic development model that we've been pursuing. We've been trying to accelerate tourism, accelerate remittances, accelerate export-led growth and foreign direct investment without having addressed the structural foundations, the, the basic pillars of economic development that must be in place before you get into export-oriented growth in, in FDI. And, and that's why I always say there is no country that can function anywhere in the world without food, without energy. Those are the foundations. You need to not skip the foundation in order to build the additional steps in the process of economic development. So are countries uh, prepared to accommodate mass climate migration, for example, or just to address the multiple challenges that we have on the health front, on the development front, and, and so on? Do we have the fiscal capacity to pay for it at the national level before we even talk about the, the international system? And doing so without causing inflation, without bankrupting nations, because the scale is massive. 
And, and that's where I, I want to start with, with this spectrum of monetary sovereignty. In other words, different countries have a different degree of monetary sovereignty. And the higher the degree of monetary sovereignty, the more fiscal policy space you have, which means the more spending capacity your government can have before you hit the inflation barrier. And of course, some countries don't even have any monetary sovereignty. Think of a country like Ecuador that completely dollarized, or think of the CFA franc zone, the colonial currency that many African countries still use to this day. Of course, you have no monetary sovereignty there. But most countries in Africa and the global south have a limited degree of monetary sovereignty. So where, what, what my research is focused on is how can I take a country with a limited degree of monetary sovereignty design a framework for economic development policies that will gradually allow you over time to increase the degree of monetary sovereignty, which means you increase the fiscal policy space available to you before you hit the, the inflation barrier. And the more external debt you have, the lower the degree of monetary sovereignty. The more desperate you are as a country to fix your exchange rate and defend the exchange, the, the weaker your monetary sovereignty. So countries with a high degree of monetary sovereignty will be countries like the US or Japan, where Japan has the highest debt to GDP ratio on the planet and the history of the universe, right? 265% last time I checked. But the entire debt stock of the Japanese government is denominated in Japanese yen, not in foreign currencies. And that creates a scenario where Japan does doesn't have to constantly defend the value of its currency. And it's not because it's a policy choice that they decided all of a sudden we want all of our debt to be external. No, because they built strong economic foundations that allowed them the privilege of not having to borrow dollars or euros to, uh, to, to run their economy. And that increases the degree of autonomy that you have. So in general, this is how most economists, most policymakers think about what can governments spend without causing inflation? We're told, well, obviously tax revenues, you know, fund government spending from a mainstream perspective. Say, sure, we can borrow up to a certain point, but, but really that's it. We can't go beyond that. And what I'd like to suggest here is that there's this additional spending capacity, that bright yellow space, that's not infinite, but it's an additional spending capacity that we can tap into and can actually stretch and expand with strategic policies. And notice the, the barrier, the limit of this spending is the risk of inflation. So I become obsessed with what determines the risk of inflation. And as you can see here, two very simple but important factors. The first one is the lack of productive capacity, which includes logistical supply chain disruptions and so on. In other words, if you have productive capacity and you spend more, it will not cause inflation. But if you run out of resources, technology, human capabilities, physical resources, and you increase spending, therefore you create additional demand for things that you don't have capacity for and you must import, then that starts the inflation pressure. So the good news about productive capacity is that it's producible. In other words, if you will invest in increasing your productive capacity, not only do you create jobs, but you also you push the risk of inflation further out and increase your fiscal spending capacity. Number two, of course, is abusive market power and price setting behavior. And that is both global and domestic. And that kind of inflation risk can't be eliminated by austerity. It can only be eliminated by taxing and regulating abusive market power out of existence. And a lot of this, a lot of this is actually domestic abusive market power via exclusive import licenses and, and such. And I'm happy to discuss some of those in, in the Q&A session. So that's the paradigm shift that we must undertake at the national level to create additional fiscal policy space and to build productive capacity in strategic areas, in priority areas. In our case, it should be food and renewable energy and gradually moving away from purely extractive industries. So if we attempt to do that, most mainstream observers will tell you, well, that's going to cause inflation. And this is the scenario that they have in mind. And I give you an example here, hypothetical example from my own country. Let's say Tunisia decides to spend 2 billion dinars on health and education, two national priorities for in dinars, not in foreign currencies. So they say, here's what's going to happen. You're going to end up with more 
imports of food and fuel and medical equipment because you're creating more jobs and, and more demand. You're going to have a larger deficit and therefore exchange rate actually over time, even hyperinflation if you continue this. And you're going to have more external debt because your central bank has to intervene and stabilize the exchange rate. And the IMF and other foreign lenders will mandate spending cuts. So you go back to square one with less investment in health and education, and you end up with more unemployment, brain drain, social, economic, political tensions. And there is no alternative. So don't even try to go into that additional fiscal policy space. And we've learned this from, from a long time ago. So that's scenario one. I'm gonna use the exact same number, 2 billion dinars of additional spending, but in a slightly different way. So that's scenario number two, the MMT approach, for those of you who are familiar with the modern monetary theory approach, this is what I suggest. If Tunisia spends now 1 billion dinar on health and education instead of two, and then the second billion dinars, you spend it on increasing domestic productive capacity in food, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and crack down on price setters and, and, and abusive market power uh, via taxation and regulation. So the exact same amount of spending, but targeted differently and more strategically. Here's what the scenario is going to look like. You're going to have fewer imports of food and energy because you're producing more domestically. A lower trade deficit because these are the biggest trade deficit contributors in, in the case of Tunisia and many countries in Africa. You're going to have a stable or even stronger exchange rate because you lowered your trade deficit. There's no inflation pass-through effect. No matter what happens to global food prices or energy prices, you're building more resilience and therefore protecting and insulating your economy from inflation. You're going to have a lower external debt over time and higher credit ratings because your, your debt burden is, is being dealt with. And you're going to increase foreign currency reserves at the central bank, more resilience to external shocks, especially on the food and energy front, a lower carbon footprint, obviously, and you have more employment, less brain drain, and improved quality of life in general. And now we're talking. Now the question becomes, is Tunisia's additional fiscal policy space only 2 billion dinars? Maybe it's 3, maybe it's 5, maybe it's 12. How do we know? What we know is the inflation risk is going to determine how much that additional policy space, fiscal policy space is, which means do we have the capacity to manage, administer, tax, and regulate in a system where we add 7 billion dinars or 12 billion dinars. If we do, then that's the, the, the additional space that we have. If we don't, then we know what needs to be done. We need to build capacity. We need to improve uh, taxing and regulatory and administrative capabilities, logistical capabilities in order to tap into that additional uh, fiscal policy space. So that's at the domestic level. We're not talking about the global financial architecture which we must address, and, and there's been a lot of discussion of it. So what not to do, this is true for countries, but this is what not to do in terms of the agenda. Multilateral often often you know, put not to do as we reform the system, not to accelerate the engines of extrapolating the global south, encourage, no, or I should say, not encourage low value added assembly line industrialization, not accelerate exports of cash crop, not encourage investments in fossil fuels and stranded assets that are accused uh, not turn a blind, uh, blind eye on illicit financial transactions, a huge contributor to, um, to the financial uh, troubles that we have, not turn a blind eye, of course, on corruption and abuse of market power, and not perpetuate the engines of the status quo. So the solutions are are summarized in, in a few structural solutions that I lay out here. Number one, investments in food sovereignty and agroecology is a must. Number two, investments in renewable energy sovereignty. And number three, high value added industrialization policies. And in the case of Africa, I underlined that this must be pan-African because some countries may not have the capability to fully um, be self-sufficient in food or in energy and, and not be able to industrialize. If you have a small economy, 
you can't industrialize in the traditional sense of the term because industrialization requires economies of scale and economies of scale under the existing system that we operate in is impossible in a country with 10 or 20 or even 30 million consumers unless you're export oriented. And if you're export oriented today, good luck competing with made in Japan, made in Germany, made in USA uh, in terms of the, the, the control of markets and technology and so on. So you end up producing components for a global supply chain, which means you don't have an industrial policy, you're contributing to somebody else's industrial policy. But the opportunity that we have in the global South in particular at this point in time has to do with the resources exclusively that Africa and America and some minerals, strategic minerals that are critical for the green energy transition, that are critical for the high-tech manufacturing sector, and that we export essentially as raw materials today. So take a block of 20, 30 African countries, um, as, as a hypothetical example, we, we have all the inputs, the raw materials needed to manufacture and deploy renewable energy infrastructure to bring electricity to the 600 million Africans today who have no access to electricity, to manufacture and deploy clean cooking technology and resources to the 950 million Africans today who are exposed to uh, cleaning, uh, to cooking uh, technology that's harmful primarily to women and, and children. So we're talking about a, an industrialization potential that has all of these components that we need, which is complementarity of resources and capabilities, a huge market demand internally that allows you to reach those economies of scale. We may lack the technological capabilities, and this is where economic diplomacy comes in where you can, as a block, negotiate with partners from the global north. That could be Japan, that could be the US, that could be China, that could be uh, uh, Germany. It doesn't matter, but it's really partnership to serve the development needs of the continent, as opposed to neo-colonial extractive relations where they get all the raw materials and then send us the finished product. That's perpetuating the trap. And this is the type of economic diplomacy that can't happen on a bilateral level, it needs to happen on a multilateral level with a, an African block or a G77 block or a global South block negotiating with a single bargaining chip. Because the bargaining chip I'm talking about here is in this particular case is critical minerals. And you can't really achieve any results with a slice of that bargaining chip. And you have to have the full bargaining chip, which means you have to have a group of countries using that bargaining chip as, as a leverage. And that becomes the bargaining chip and the vision that you develop for yourself in order to impose a reset of the global financial architecture. Because again, a financial system that failed us economically, financially, ecologically, can't be the same system that will save us today. So that means resetting the vision for economic development, for climate action, for food security on a global scale, and then mandating from development financial institutions, from multilateral financial institutions, that they must channel strategic financial resources into these strategic sectors, as opposed to simply calling on them to be more transparent and to scale up climate finance, but to scale up climate finance that feeds the engines of the entrapment of neocolonial uh, deficiencies that we've that we've talked about uh, earlier today. So that's really part of the, the vision that we must uh, assert. And and here I I already explained to you what what a South South strategic partnership would would look like. This is just a summary slide for it. And for a country or a regional block that lacks uh, a basic level of resilience on the food front, on the energy front. Uh, you you have no bargaining chips. You can't even walk away from negotiation table because you'll continue through this process to lose economic and monetary sovereignty uh, over time. So the, the spectrum of monetary sovereignty that we're talking about, the strategic investments and channeling financial resources, mandating that multilateral development institutions are channel of financing in order to move countries from the weaker end of the uh, monetary sovereignty spectrum to the higher end of the monetary uh, has to be part of 
the discussion when we talk about reforming the global financial uh, architecture. So to summarize here in the summary slide, and I'm close to wrapping up here, the Global South has low degree of monetary sovereignty, is not responsible for climate change. Take Africa alone. Cumulative emissions, we're talking about 4% of global emissions, even though we're a continent of 17%. Of, of the global population. We emit the same amount as Spain alone uh, annually. Um, we have high external debt, low productive capacity, low research and development capacity that must be uh, addressed. And we suffer from this neocolonial extractive economic system compared to the global North with high degree of monetary sovereignty, responsible for climate change, let's call it what it is, it's climate debt, has low to no external debt to speak of, has high productive capacity, high research and development capacity, has all the tools that it takes to repair the system and benefits from this existing financial architecture that it designed for itself. So what we need to do here is directly talk about repairing a global financial architecture. And when I talk about reparations, it's not simply a monetary transaction, a transfer of financial resources, but it's includes transfer of technology to repair broken economies. And it's also repairing the global financial architecture as in the regulatory systems, as in the rules of trade, the rules of finance that create the suction mechanism um, for from, from the global South. And Africa as a, as a continent, I uh, just wanted to flash this in front of you, the massive potential for renewable energy uh, revolution is, is here on this continent and in the global south in general, but it can't be sold as a potential for decarbonizing our economies. Yes, we want to decarbonize, but at the same time, we also want to decolonize the economic system. In other words, we want to manufacture and deploy the renewable energy infrastructure that we build on this continent, as opposed to importing the technology and deploying it and then replacing it every, every few years. That's an industrialization plan for the global north. That's not an industrialization plan for, for the global south. And in terms of the, the transportation and the connectedness, and I know Anktad is takes this very seriously, the potential for also manufacturing the uh, railways of the future on the continent as opposed to the highways of the future and decarbonizing transportation and linking economies in, in strategic ways, we have all the raw materials, we have all the human capabilities, we have the market demand for it. What we need is building and manufacturing and industrializing in order to deliver this on, on the continent and other parts of the global south. So to conclude, uh, we're running out of time and I'm also running out of time. Uh, the climate crisis, the poly crisis that we're dealing with, they call for bold and urgent and radical transformation, again, as in going to the roots of the problem. Uh, the current policies that we have, the discussions are unfortunately aiming at, at a level that is low. It, it tends to be expensive, ineffective, and really dangerous economically, ecologically, and, and politically also. And a, a realistic plan for a just transition requires a fundamental restructuring of the global financial architecture, not just window dressing, but really changing the model of development so that we change the engines of development. Because if an engine is producing pollution, inequality, and debt, it doesn't work to fuel it with more financing in order to produce more of the results. What you need is to change the engine so that it's automatically producing sustainability, equity, justice, and stability. Um, and finally, I truly believe that this better system is within reach. This is like a real Wakanda is right there, accessible to us. It's not a fantasy. And I believe it's possible, desirable, and affordable. Thank you so much for listening. Happy to answer questions. Ursula, I'm not able to hear you. Hello. From there, can it's you the talk from there? Over yeah, I can hear you now. Can hear you now. Oh, you can hear me. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for a very, very clear and uh, and comprehensive uh, presentation, which uh, 
Well, certainly echoes some of the topics uh, which were discussed already yesterday. We talked about uh, traps related to the to trade and the global value chain, and but also on economic de dependency. So certainly these are topics that, that resonate in your presentation. But above all, I would like to say that it really uh, uh, is very much in line with our own uh, analysis of uh, inflation, first of all, in the trade and development report in the past year and, and before, and also yeah. more generally yeah. on fiscal space. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to give the word, the, uh, the word to, to Katie McCallably Swan <laughs> for the discussion. Thank you, Ursula, and thank you, Fidel. It's great to see you and to to hear you in action. Um, I um, yeah, to echo uh, Ursula's point, I think that in listening to your presentation, I think that there's a lot of touch points between the work that we're doing now um, at UNCTAD, but also in the UNCTAD tradition. You know, a lot of your presentation is focused on on dependency and on these structural dependencies and how do we tackle these global asymmetries, which goes back, of course, to the very founding of, of UNCTAD um, and that sort of moment around the new international economic order, the, the Bandung moment. Um, and at the core of your argument is this role of industrialization and, and the role that that has to play to overcome primary commodity dependence. Another part of your um, presentation, which uh, really resonated with some of the conversations we have been having over recent years, and I think this is reflected in our trade and development reports, which are, of course, the flagship reports from UNCTAD. In 2019, we had the Financing a Global Green New Deal report. 2021 was focused on adaptation, um, which, you know, in reference to your agricultural focus. And in 2022, we were focused on regionalization and south-south strategies. So you can see there's a lot of uh, synergies here in, in the questions we're asking ourselves internally as well. But you pose this question about a, a new development paradigm and you sort of compare this, you know, modernization approach, these linear um, mainstream approaches to how we understand development versus this more structural uh, understanding and particularly on the sort of sovereignty uh, that that word comes up a lot in in the in the reading that you assigned which I think is is really significant but I suppose um, one thing I would like to and, and I should I should say actually that um, in my response I'll, I'll I'll be giving some commentary but also pushing some questions back at you to get the conversation started for the Q&A and um, one thing I um, I'm really interested in um, is hearing your perspective on what is this new development paradigm, considering that we 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 have moved on from the NIE moment, and you you recognise you know the ecological constraints, uh, well-being, and and these other elements that need to be considered as part of a development strategy, um, and there's also you know the reference to the the what now report. And the fact that it was way ahead of its time, it had ecological constraints, it had these considerations in it. Um, but as well as these sort of multifaceted elements of what we want to consider as development, we also have a very different structure in the global economy. And you reference that too, you know, we have um, financial liberalization, which has led to the, the massive expansion of the global financial sector, which totally changes the sort of uh, power brokerage between North, South, public, private, um, the movement of capital obviously has massive implications on what a new development paradigm um, might be. Um, and I suppose just to, to, to reference your, your last slide when you compare the, the, sort, the South and the North, I think this is also relevant, not just for the South, but also the North. And um, I think you're quite flattering when you say that the productive capacities in the North are good, <laughs> because as we can see, you know, that, that this is not being, they're not necessarily in a, in a fantastic situation either. And in fact, you are seeing an emerging developmentalism in a lot of those economies, which is not afforded, that same policy space is not afforded to the South at the moment. So what is this new development paradigm? What are the constraints? And particularly, you know, in thinking about this traditional understanding of the role of industrialization, which traditionally, again, has been very carbon intensive, you know, what are the questions that are, that are still to be answered around this development model such that we can have that increase in productive capacity, but not at the risk of exceeding our ecological constraints, the global carbon budget, because we know that when we do that, 
the development paradigm will change again because it will not be possible, of course, in a, in a lot of a lot of places. And I suppose in having this conversation about how this the structure of the the global economy has changed, I think you know we have these live conversations at the moment with regards you know the BRICS countries and and de-dollarization and you know attempts in South South strategies to disrupt some of the hegemony of 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 the, the structures of the economy right now. So, so I would love to hear your perspectives on those and in particular in relation to the conversation around uh, critical minerals. You know, we've seen some countries really put their neck out in the last couple of years. We have Mexico who tried to, you know, start a conversation around the nationalization of, of, of lithium stocks. We also have Indonesia who've introduced export bans on nickel in an attempt to, to sort of onshore and, and repatriate supply chains for nickel. Um, and what we see in response is a disciplinary action as, as a sort of kickback from um, the, 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 the world economy, particularly obviously from the North, that this is flying in the face of our, our, our multilateral trade principles, um, which of course, you know, we can, we, can, we can talk about the hypocrisy there considering the recent massive industrial programs that, that those same countries are implementing, um, but they don't, <laughs> fortunately, unfortunately, have those critical minerals on their own territories to be able to do the same thing. Um, I suppose just in reference to our own work, I think one of the one of the recent publications that I think speaks really strongly to to the, the presentation you made, and particularly this just transition element, is a background paper we prepared in advance of COP27 last year that was looking at just transition from the global level. And the reason that we wanted to um, a, a, approach this question was because we felt like the discussion around just transition had been very much narrowed to just talking about decarbonization, which is of course a very North centric approach to thinking about just transition, but also discuss just transition in terms of within national boundaries. When we, when we know that in an interconnected globalized world, the idea that an, uh, you can only think about a national level strategy for just transition, um, is, is not serious. Um, and so we, we, we approached this question of just transition on these two levels. You know, what, what, are the, what would a, a vision of just transition from the South look like? Recognizing, of course, there's huge heterogeneity across developing countries. So we're, we're making generalizations of the kind of structural constraints that they, that they might face, but also what is the kind of enabling environment that's needed at the multilateral level if we're gonna tackle these, these inequalities. And you, you highlighted yourself some of the inequalities, particularly in, uh, in, in carbon emissions, the fact that this is of course the, re the responsibility of the North who've, who've, who've emitted the overwhelming uh, amount of, uh, of emissions and continue to have per capita emissions, which can be 50, 60 times um, the, the, their peers in the South. Um, so, so, you know, just as a quick snapshot of how we approach this, we looked at it from a means of implementation level. So thinking about it through the framework of the UNFCCC negotiations, where there are three means of implementation, finance, technology, and capacity. And in looking at those three elements, we, we tried to explain what the constraints are on Southern just transitions um, that might differ from the North. So for example, with finance, we, we identified four particular constraints. One was the, the low uh, financial support for just transition, which is, as Fadel mentioned, you know, the 100 billion has never been met and it was never enough. Um, the fact that there's very restricted fiscal space, although Fadel might come back and, uh, and, and, and push back against that, but within, an, within a sort of context of great sovereign debt distress, um, Fiscal, restricted fiscal space is a, is a reality for, for many developing countries. The high exposure to volatility, which again, Fidel mentioned there, the boom bust cycles, the fact that um, that, that, that creates a very volatile uh, environment in which to be able to deliver a long-term just transition developmental plan. And then finally, the fact that financing or external financing is very expensive um, in contrast to what just transitions in the North might look like. When we look at technology, um, we see very concentrated intellectual property ownership in the North. Um, which then leads to barriers to technology transfer. And this isn't climate change, but of course we've seen this during the pandemic with regards 
the intellectual property related to uh, vaccines, the fact that that was created in the North, but can, uh, contained there such that many, many countries were not able to access vaccines or to be able to use their own productive capacities to develop vaccines. In a situation like the pandemic, where we had such a sort of immediate need to end the pandemic, um, that wasn't possible. So in a long term sort of geopolitical restructuring around the future of green technology, that looks even less likely. Um, and then, of course, the stranded asset risk. We are seeing a huge amount of emphasis on the gas capacity and other sort of fossil fuel investment being directed um, to some to some countries in the south. And that in a long term um, is likely to lead to stranded assets um, because of that sort of latecomer rather than being able to, to leapfrog. Um, and that of course is very much related to the geopolitical interests of those countries that would like to receive, receive gas um, exports from, from the south. And then lastly, looking at capacity, we looked a little bit more at the, the structure Again, in generalizations, considering heterogeneity and it, the, the structure of economies which pose different challenges. For example, the informality of the labor force, the, uh, the inadequacy of energy access at the time of writing, I think we had more than 900 million people in the world without access to, to electricity. That's not a decarbonization issue. That's a, we need to be carbonizing more issue. That's a, we need to be actually generating more energy. Um, the restricted policy space to be able to mount these industrial sorts of policies. And then, of course, the spillover impacts from the north, the fact that things like carbon border adjustment mechanisms or, or other things that are beginning to be implemented in the north disproportionately impact the, the south's capacity to, well, e whether that's in, in more uh, resources coming from the south in terms of taxation in the case of CBAM, or whether that's um, you know, restrictions on their policy and fiscal space as a consequence of the industrial projects in the north. So all of this led us to sort of propose um, in echoing the sort of Global Green New Deal uh, uh, paper or a report that was done in 2019, the sorts of the, the elements that were necessary to support um, developing countries and their own ambitions for just transitions, which included the fact that we need huge scale vastly accelerated uh, decarbonization in the north because it, the, the numbers don't add up in order to be able to have that ecological space for the south to develop the north needs to be emitting less we also need expansionary and coordinated fiscal and monetary policies to be able to have that um, macroeconomic positive investment-led approach to just transition which of course that's not the environment we're looking at at the moment we also need affordable technology transfer because without that, that the, the, the technology will continue to be concentrated in some parts of the world. Um, and as Fidel highlighted, the South will continue to be treated as a place for secondhand or redundant technologies. Um, and then we also need additional financial support. And I think that that is also represented in some ways in, in your own report, um, Fidel, and, and in the, own, the, the readings that you assigned for this. So I, I suppose just to wrap up, all of this in some ways depends on one key factor, which is not necessarily always the discussion um, in, in economic conferences, but it's political will, because what all of this runs up against is the political will component. We need extra resources, but that depends on political will. We need technology transfer, that depends on political will. And how do we get out of this, this, um, this routine of having to uh, try and generate political will? You know, in the discussion around political will, whether we're talking about climate finance, whether we're talking about ODA, um, you know, ODA is supposed to be 0.7% commitment of gross national income. It's currently around about half of that. Um, if we're always on this wheel of, quit, of of chasing political will, what are the alternatives? And I suppose to finish off, I, I want to return to something which I think was a common thread through the readings that you assigned, which was the importance of social mobilization and, and public engagement in this question. Because I think without that public engagement component, I'm not sure how the political will gets generated. And I think you make a really important point in the, in the, in the readings that this is a, a, south, a question for the South in particular, in terms of South-South sort of uh, collaboration, 
and strategic uh, engagement at the diplomatic level. But what is also, I suppose you also highlight the role that the working classes of the North also have to play in that. So I've given you a few questions um, I'll stop there because I think I've probably went over time now, Ursula, but thank you very much for having participated today and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, fantastic. So we can uh, uh, immediately start the discussion. I myself have uh, uh, one question that kind of follows up on some of the, of the issues that Katie brought up, on, uh, especially on, uh, if I don't want to be um, a little uh, to Polenko, but uh, the issue of uh, of investment in uh, extraction of fossil fuels uh, and in infrastructure, um, I would like to, if you if you could expand on that because you know as you teach us investment is is investment it creates savings it creates financial resources so if there is a demand for fossil fuel uh, at this point you know it's still investment um, to be le less uh, I mean polemical I mean uh, just I guess there are three issues there. Like one is uh, um, there's a demand, immediate demand for fossil fuels. The second is, as you said, explained very well, there's a problem of producing crude fossil fuels and refining and getting the revenues out of it. And then uh, there's the issue of the international pricing uh, mechanisms for fossil fuel and oil specifically, but also gas and how that fuel speculation and goes all in the wrong direction. So, uh, so maybe if you can expand on, on that topic that, that Katie also mentioned uh, in her discussion. And then I see there's, uh, so there was one, Manuel, and then uh, later we can uh, collect a few questions and then you can answer them all. Hello. Um, thank you very much. I enjoyed a lot, uh, especially focusing on the structural uh, difference between uh, Global South and Global North, especially for this uh, just transition. Now, uh, my question um, are two. Uh, the first question is, uh, if you can tell us what are the like macroeconomic vulnerabilities that could come in a just transition for countries that are net exporters in oil, in coal, that are really, really important for their public budget, or even for the investment. I mean, I think that this will generate, uh, it, it depends exactly on the, on the country. However, I think there are, if you know there are common problems that it will cause um, in the case of uh, transition. The second question, or more like a comment, what would you say to governments that actually has the political will to make this transition? However, they can face many problems as in employment, as in for indirect investment, uh, devaluation of the currency, if they stop uh, exporting. I know that your, your take is more on the preparing sovereignty. However, I'm more concerned about the traverse, uh, the, tr the transition from uh, the state of business now and a uh, low carbon uh, economy. Yeah, those are my two concerns. And thank you very much. It was really clarifying. Hello, um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, Fadel, my question is very specific. Uh, you talk about the monetary sovereignty from uh, an MMT perspective. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the concept of monetary sovereignty for MMT, under, uh, as I understand from the literature, talks about, in general, uh, about a state that has its own IOU and tax the people in the state IOU. Uh, there is endogenous money or treasury in the central bank relationship, but in general, the core is the tax driving money. Um, so, in the sense, German, Italy, and uh, France do not have monetary sovereignty, which puts them in the lower degree of monetary sovereignty in your presentation. So, uh, I was wondering what is the concept that you were talking about, monetary sovereignty? And wouldn't it be better to call uh, economic sovereignty than monetary sovereignty? So this is my specific question. Thank you. More questions for this first round? We can have more room for one. OK, please. OK, thank you, Fado, for the 
great presentation. So my question is focusing on just transition. Um, given a case study of South Africa, South Africa is a country with a complex history of inequality and we realize that it has a significant dependence on coal for energy production, which contributes to the environmental degradation and climate change. But my question is, how can we ensure that the transition to cleaner energy sources does not exacerbate the existing inequalities and social disparities in African countries, specifically in South Africa? Thank you. Okay, Padal. Over to you. We can't hear him. Thank you so much. Thank you so uh, much for, 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 for the Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, there's a little. Yeah, there's a little uh, time delay. So time delay. So I'll just keep, uh, keep going. Um, um, so I'll uh, I'll I'll start by uh, um, sort of responding to. Katie a little bit. Uh, I think um, saying that my makeup is uh, is uh, heaven is, is Jan, my mentor for, for many years and, and he was at UNCTAD for a decade or two uh, helping produce the uh, the annual. So no wonder we were on the same page on, on a lot of issues. Um, uh, I'll I'll try to come back to uh, some comments uh, related to Katie's uh, remarks, um, but I'll I'll start with with the more direct questions, and then I'll go back to uh, to Katie's uh, remarks. So the, the the question you you had, Ursula, about the uh, stranded assets and fossil fuel investments, um, the the way I look at it is is the following: we we know that climate change requires phasing out fossil fuels. Sooner or later, it, it will happen. We know that the technological development and efficiency of renewable energy capabilities and the declining cost of renewable energy technology will just outcompete fossil fuels uh, ultimately, hopefully sooner rather than, than later. We also know that many countries are already heavily uh, engaged in a decarbonization process. So at some point they will reach levels where they will no longer uh, create that additional demand for fossil fuels, especially for electricity production in, in particular, and, and even for, for transportation ultimately. So when we get to that point, a lot of infrastructure is being put in place today. And I mentioned 500 billion to a trillion dollars a year of additional infrastructure. Unfortunately, a lot of that accelerated after the Ukraine-Russia conflict uh, with European investments in Africa to develop uh, LNG capabilities and, and pipelines and so on, natural gas pipelines. Um, when you put in place those investments, it's with the expectation that the lifetime of returns generated from that investment will be 30 to 50 years, depending on, uh, on the infrastructure. So you're booking potential returns that will be suppressed by the transition to renewable energy, which means that that asset that you're created will be stranded asset physically. Here, we're talking about the physical stranded assets. Climate change also will render a lot of real estate physical assets, stranded assets, uh, a resort on a coastal um, you know, a coastal property uh, such as resorts and hotels that will be flooded with with the impact of climate change is not going to generate returns over time. But then you have the financial stranded assets and financial markets. And here we're talking about balance sheets in the financial system and university endowments and pension funds that are packed with climate risks, packed with carbon risks. And here I, I urge everybody to take a look at uh, the work done by NGFS, the Network for Greening the Financial System. Uh, this network was finally joined by the Federal Reserve Bank and the European Central Bank a couple of years ago, finally joined uh, or exactly at the same time, not because they wanted to join, but because financial institutions, private financial institutions, urged them to do something about the financial risks that they have on their own balance sheets. Because if I have financial risks on my balance sheets, climate financial risks on my balance sheet, and I decide to decarbonize my balance sheet, but my competitors are not, 
then I'll be at a disadvantage. So divesting from fossil fuels, if one bank does it and the others don't, it puts them at a disadvantage. So they urge the regulatory institutions, the Fed, the SEC, the European Central Bank, to organize an orderly decarbonization process for balance sheets. And that's exactly what, what the Fed and, and the SEC and, and the ECB uh, are in the process of doing, unfortunately, too slowly, but it's, it's a process that's happening. So a, a lot of the, the argument for uh, phasing out fossil fuels is not about um, the global south, it's not purely about climate change, it's about the financial risks that are built into what we call the carbon bubble, the, the, the market bubble, that's going to burst. And a lot of those losses will be in the global north, will be in pension funds and you know, university endowments and, and, and balance sheets of, of corporations and financial institutions in the global north. So that's kind of a, a, a little um, kind of reflection on this. And, and, and we're seeing a lot of it in action right now. Insurance companies are refusing to insure properties and flood risks and fire risk uh, areas. And banks are refusing to issue mortgages without such insurance. So you can't even refinance uh, a mortgage. So it's increasingly becoming uh, a serious financial reality in the global north. And that's where we can align our goals on the climate front, on the financial stability front, uh, both in the global north and the global south to resolve this uh, this issue. Um, uh, the question about macro uh, economic vulnerabilities for, for countries uh, in the global south that um, uh, what if they if they depend on fossil fuel exports, um, a case in point is is now a reality. I mean, this was a hypothetical question uh, for a, a number of years when we we're advocating for uh, phasing out fossil fuels. Now it's a reality for Ecuador because people voted sixty percent in favor of uh, ending fossil fuel extraction in the Amazon, and that's a huge financial uh, hit to the Ecuadorian government. Uh, so it's, a, and it's, and it's even more challenging because we're talking about a dollarized economy that actually can't issue its own currency, right? So it's not a hypothetical question. It's a reality now that Ecuador must face. Uh, and, and you have two options, either ignore the democratic process and continue in the name of economic necessity because we need those exports to, to, to fund the budget, or meet the challenge and figure out a way of transitioning away from fossil fuel exports as a source of government revenue uh, and, and undergo a process of just transition. And it's going to be challenging. I will not uh, mince my words about uh, this because of the extra challenge of not having uh, your, your national currency, not having economic sovereignty at that level. But it's challenging because uh, it's very hard for a single country to do it alone. So this is where a just transition and economic restructuring of the Ecuadorian economy requires uh, assistance, cooperation, solidarity, uh, and financing in order to build a different economic base that will preserve jobs, preserve incomes, and preserve uh, quality of life and enhance quality of life, hopefully, over time. Uh, and and that is something that I am personally vested in um, and trying to um, support our Ecuadorian colleagues as uh, as much as possible in these discussions. And it has to be a global conversation, especially a global South conversation and a regional conversation in terms of how do we honor the democratic process and honor the the demands of the uh, of the ecological community internationally and 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 not throw Ecuador under the bus economically, but rather use this opportunity to um, to reinvent a model of economic development that works for Ecuador and, and other countries. And whatever Ecuador does is going to be the the model and the pathway for other countries for a just transition. This is not a hypothetical report or a set of suggestions. This is going to be people's livelihood on the line and a reality that we must build uh, together. Um, the question about what do you say to governments who actually agree with the just transition, but but face the, the practicality, the reality of how do you do it? So uh, of course, the longer you wait, the more challenging it is. And the worst time to do this transition 
is in times of crisis because you're you're facing multiple uh, multiple pressure points. But uh, a lot of people tell me, well, what you're proposing is a long term strategy. It's not the crisis moment is not the moment to do it, and and so on. And I always say the long term starts today. The long term started yesterday, actually. So you can take even the smallest steps in doing the following. For example, think of every metric ton of wheat or rice or corn you produce domestically today by shifting a relatively small amount of resources, for example, from producing cash crops to producing native crops and, and crops that feed the nation. Every metric ton you produce locally saves you its equivalent in dollars that you have to pay for import and dollars that you have to borrow in interest payment you must service sometimes for decades. Every green kilowatt hour you produce locally also saves you its equivalent and multiple in terms of debt and interest you're, you're paying on, on the debt, in addition to the ecological benefits and the quality of life benefits and the jobs that you create domestically and the food security and energy security that you create. So we may not be able to transition to you know 100% food security in a year or a decade even, but every step you take in that direction transforms your economy and makes it more resilient. That's why I, I insisted on using that example of hypothetical example of Tunisia investing in health and education and, and how you can begin that, that process because those are con concrete steps countries in the global South can take with very little international cooperation or assistance. Of course, cooperation and assistance will be tremendous. And that's why we're talking about reforming the global financial architecture so that when the IMF comes in and negotiates uh, uh, Tunisia's debt problem or Ghana's debt problem, on the table right there is how do we avoid going back to the same negotiation table in three or five years with more debt problem? Part of that negotiation is tap into the resilience and sustainability trust, for example, that the IMF created and say part of this package of reforms is investment in food security, investment in renewable energy security. And we're sort of addressing two problems at the same time. We're addressing the climate challenge. We're scaling up climate finance. We're transforming a, a, an economy in the global south, making it more resilient more resilient, and we're reducing the debt burden over time, and therefore the need to go back to the negotiation table for more debt restructuring. So these are the small steps that can be taken at the national level, at the sub-regional level in the global south with cooperation, and most importantly, at the international level with multilateral development uh, institutions and financial institutions that need to change their development model, that need to reshape their conditionalities you know, I'd like to have a conditionality that says we'll bring you, you know, relief, but you must restructure your economy, not superficially, but actually structurally to build this level of resilience. So that's where that's where I would I would start um, with that question uh, on the MMT question on uh, on the concept of monetary sovereignty versus uh, economic sovereignty. Um, I, I rushed through that part, but uh, you're you're right. The the concept of monetary sovereignty does start with a country issuing its own currency, taxing uh, its population in the same national currency, but it does have two additional layers, which is number three in that conceptual definition of monetary sovereignty is uh, a country that borrows or issues debt in its national currency. And that's where you see divergence between countries with high degree of monetary sovereignty like Japan and the US versus countries in the global south that are forced into borrowing in foreign currencies in order to stabilize the exchange rates, in order to um, deal with the pass-through inflation effect and all that. So that's a third element that's important. And it's not something that you, um, you know, monetary sovereignty is not something that you declare by degree, by decree. It's something that you acquire with strategic investments, which is the, the focus of this uh, discussion. And number four, the, the fourth element in the concept of monetary sovereignty that's related to the third is the fact that when the more desperate you are as a country to fix or stabilize your exchange rate, defend your exchange rate, the lower the degree of monetary sovereignty, because if you're defending your exchange rate, you have to do it by borrowing dollars and that your external debt and that keeps you in that in that lower end of the spectrum. 
so the 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 solutions to this is is in, in summary what what I was suggesting in, in this report and uh, in this uh, presentation, which is what are the strategic economic reforms that you must put in, pla in place in order to gradually acquire a higher and higher degree of monetary sovereignty. So in that sense, when you uh, ask about Germany or Italy or any country in in the um, uh, in the eurozone, uh, you're absolutely right. You're you're not able to uh, to claim. Uh, that you have uh, a high degree of monetary sovereignty. But how do you make up for a low degree of monetary sovereignty? Because even countries in the CFA zone who still use colonial currencies, a country like Ecuador, the only way to acquire a higher level of fiscal policy space when you can't even control the issuance of your own currency is by being a massive export-oriented country like Saudi Arabia, right? Um, so how do you do it? You build massive amount of foreign currency reserves. You try to be uh, export oriented, export, uh, uh, you generate an, an export surplus like, like Germany, and then you can make up for the, the lost sovereignty and you can create additional fiscal policy, but you do it in a, in a very perverse way that's unnecessary. So we can talk about what kind of reforms need to be put in place in the Eurozone system to give all the Eurozone members a much higher degree of monetary sovereignty, for example, and to tackle climate change, to tackle all, all challenges. Um, and and the, the last question I, I heard from, from the colleague from South Africa uh, um, related to the just transition and, and how do we ensure that transitioning away from coal uh, does not exacerbate inequality, uh, for example. Um, and this is, again, a, a global South conversation. I, I don't want this to be um, you know, perceived as this is just South Africa. Every other country in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and, 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 and specific and the coal dependence makes it even more challenging because you're singling out a particular sector, a particular subset of communities and, and workers um, and just transition, it's not just a transition, it's really underlining the concept of justice, which means we're transitioning from an old system to a new system and acknowledging that the old system was packed with injustices um, and, and in general, not just in the case of South Africa. And we want to transition in a system that repairs some of that damage and repair of the injustices. So how do you do it in, in practical terms? We're talking about moving away from coal. That doesn't mean throwing away all the communities and, and, their, and their jobs and so on. It means having a strategic transition plan for each community. And that includes jobs training that are paid that, rather than a burden on individuals to undertake. Development, community development plans that ensure access to resources access to jobs, access to education and vocational training capabilities, and, and, and not telling coal workers and coal miners that, yes, we're transitioning into a high-tech universe, so now what we need you to do is go learn how to code and, and go back to school and, and you'll get the high-tech jobs. That's, that's throwing people under the bus. So it takes a, an actual strategic plan at the community level in order to create the new industries of the future. And every time we've gone through an industrial revolution, we know this for a fact, this is not specific to, to South Africa. Every time we have a, a technological revolution, an industrial revolution, there's a, there's a basic underlying fact is that some jobs will be destroyed and others will be created. And the skills mismatch between the old jobs and the new jobs can only be uh, uh, closed if we simultaneously and in advance, prepare our skills uh, for the transition. And the only way to do it is by investing in education, technical skills, vocational skills, typically higher levels of skills. And if we don't do that as, as part of systematic just transition, then we're guaranteeing that we're going to perpetuate the inequality. We're going to throw some people under the bus and, and we're not going to, we can't call that a just transition. So I hope that's that's helpful. Um, I'll try to go back to some of the comments from from Katie very briefly if we if we have a moment. I can't cover everything. Um, most of it I, I agree with, um, uh, obviously. 
Uh, but on the critical minerals question, for example, uh, and I mentioned that we and the global South, Africa, Latin America, and some Pacific Island nations, essentially control, or at least in principle control, uh, all of those resources. But in the last few months, if you haven't noticed, it's not our countries that have formed uh, a strategic uh, agreement or cooperation on, on how we use critical minerals, how we uh, market them, how do we protect them. There's individual countries, yeah, they imposed bans, export bans that insisted on processing some of the minerals domestically before they're exported. And, and those are great steps. But simultaneously, the buyers of critical minerals have already formed their club. Not only do they have the Paris Club, the London Club, but now they also have the Critical Minerals Club, which is the buyers, uh, that is Europe, Japan, the United States. And the reason the club is organized is that they can uh, secure access to those critical minerals at favorable prices from global South nations. And, you know, I'm not a diplomat here, so I'm not going to, you know, hide anything that's out there in the public. It's really to, you know, uh, push back against China's dominance in the critical mineral space and the process and, and manufacturing space. And in that regard, the U.S. in particular was willing to give uh, the DRC and Zambia and other critical mineral uh, countries um, the right, quote unquote, the right to process a little bit of the critical minerals at home before they're safely channeled into the global north uh, industrial space. So in that sense, it's a, it's a strategic move for the U.S. to say, oh, yeah, that's that's great. You can ban exports and you can you know do some of the processing as long as it's under our umbrella and channeled towards our industries slightly away from the Chinese satellite. Um, and, and that's a reality. I mean, why why would there be such you know, huge interest from the U.S. in, quote unquote, assisting um, specific countries like Zambia, for example, in, in this process. And of course, it's not just the U.S. that's um, participating in this set of negotiations. It's also the IMF. You know, how convenient you have a debt distress situation, conditionalities that are, uh, that are you know, very um, painful uh, and a little bit of relief on, you know, uh, on, on the critical mineral space. So it is time for us to create the Kinshasa Club, right? Let's call it, for example, um, where we not only use that as a as a way to kind of form a, a cartel and 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 set prices and so on. That's not really the, the 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 benefit from from a club, but it's really about having a multilateral global South conversation about what is the industrialization potential that we can build to serve our economies as opposed to export even the processed minerals that's that's still at the very low end of the industrialization process and i'll give you an example of um uh, of an industrialization model that's being packaged and sold on on this continent as as the future and and that is um the the green industrial park in namibia which is going to be fueled by renewable energy investments uh, from from Germany in particular. Uh, if you you know sift through the details and look at what is actually being manufactured in that green industrial zone that's supposed to be the the, the model for for Africa, it's fueled by renewable energy and lots of green hydrogen, which is really dangerous in the case of a country like Namibia that is experiencing severe droughts. Green hydrogen requires a massive amount of water uh, through desalinization that also has ecological uh, impacts. But producing green hydrogen and renewable energy to fuel an industrial park that is exclusively, almost exclusively, assembly line industrial parks with all imported parts uh, and, and essentially outsourced manufacturing from Germany and the rest of Europe that is no longer needed in Europe and calling that a model for development, that's greenwashing uh, the entrapment uh, that I was describing earlier because you're locked into low value added manufacturing, obsolete technologies, assembly line for exports, not for building a development foundation for your own country or continent. And the fact that it's fueled by green hydrogen or, or green electricity doesn't make it 
um, uh, any different than the previous form of industrialization that we've seen um, in, in, in the global south. So these are the, the, the things that we must watch for as we, um, as we scale up financing for green industrialization. Not, not everything that looks like a factory is actually industrialization. Uh, and, and Namibia's case is uh, as, as case in point, and we see similar situation with the aid package, quote unquote, aid package from the EU to Tunisia. It's it's really outsourcing obsolete technologies. It's you know an Erasmus uh, expanded Erasmus program for Tunisian uh, universities and youth. That's really a brain drain mechanism. It's not the educational cooperation. So we have to watch for the false solutions um, uh, on the climate front, on the development front, and, and be careful about this. Otherwise, we can't have a, a just transition. So I hope that uh, answers some of the questions, and I'm happy to, to continue if, if we have time. Thank you so much.